Thank you. We're going to start now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining at this difficult time um, for all of us, and certainly during your lunch period, to get a sneak peek um, uh, about what we can expect from the ECRD and to understand a little bit more about um, how the rare 2030 foresight study is going to lay a foundation for some of the discussions that are going to happen in the six themes of the conference. So um, I uh, hope that you will gain um, a few insights about the project, understand a bit more um, about how they're related to the conference, and to maybe get an idea of the work that we've been doing um, through the, the speakers on the panel. I just want to remind everyone that if you haven't registered already for the conference, um, to please do so. It's really um, a pivotal moment for the rare disease community to come together. So um, you can see on the screen here, as well as in the chat box, the link to the registration, as well as the Rare 2030 website. We're joined by um, a large group of panelists today. Jan Lacan, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Eurotis Rare Diseases in uh, Europe. Andrea Ricci, Director of EC Nova, our foresight expert in the Rare 2030 project. Maria Montefusco, President of Rare Diseases Sweden, as well as co-chair of the ECRD program committee. Professor Milan Matzek, Professor and Head of the Department of Biology and Medical Genetics uh, at the Mattel University in Prague, and also co-chair of the ECRD program committee, as well as two uh, sign language interpreters. Thank you for joining us, Tina Urbanich and Oliver Pulio. So I just want to remind you of a few technical details before we begin. We have a chat box, of course, if you've noticed, we can't um, interact with such a large group, but I really encourage you to type in uh, maybe some of the main learnings that you come out um, with from this webinar as the main point is to make sure to prepare you to best interact in terms of the connection of the future <laughs> foresight study and the ECRD. I also welcome, of course, any um, questions uh, around the content, but if we can maybe focus all of the questions on, on that and not so much on the technical uh, pieces around the platform now that it's online, the ECRD, and any questions around registration, if you could hold off on those, anyone who's registered will be uh, receiving those in um, a short amount of time. So uh, I also wanted to let you know that there are a certain number of functions that might be helpful for us to better see the sign language interpretation. So if you go onto the speakers, you can either do a gallery um, or a speaker view. And on each speaker, you'll see three dots in the top right corner of their photo. If you click that, you have a drop down menu and one of your options is pin video. And that allows you to zoom in on one of the speakers and see the interpretations better. So with that, I leave the floor to Jan. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. We do appreciate that you have prioritized this webinar over your lunch, and uh, we committed to make it worth your efforts by providing you with useful information and sharing good time together. The reason to be online uh, for this conference uh, for to and for today's webinar is obviously the impact of COVID 19. Though to be more specific, and if you really insist making it to Stockholm, you need to know that the venue of the conference has been transformed into a 600 bed hospital for uh, COVID uh, patients. So that really tells about the current impact. The European Conference on Rare Disease and Orphan Products is indeed the largest rare disease policy event and we're proud of it every two years, and that is our 10th edition. We take stock of the recent development in policy at national or European level, also international increasingly. We discuss the ongoing ones and try to prepare debate over the orientation for the next two, three years. And this conference is a patient-led conference and the co-organizers are off a net and we have privilege to have a program committee composed of all stakeholders. And for the webinar today, we have two co-chair of this year conference with Milan Macek and Maria Montefusco. And this multi-stakeholder dimension is essential to us in the conference 
in order to integrate these different perspectives into the policy development. Precisely for the conference this year, we are engaging all stakeholders. And I would like to insist on one thing because we count on you for that also, is that being online provides a new and unique opportunity to engage more people who could not afford usually either to make the time or to spend the money on the travel and accommodation or for the registration. So we really made it very special this year. It's uh, very cheap for patients representative from patient organizations, either member or non-member of your orders. It is also cheap, for, it's only 40 euros, for the members of the Academia European French Network, hospital clinicians, it's very reasonable at 150 uh, euros, and it is free, completely free for all officials. And I insist on that because that's a category of stakeholder who have always the difficulty to find the time or to have the, the budget to join us for the conferences. So all the HTA colleagues or in regulatory agencies, in ministries of health or research, payers and reimbursing authorities should really be encouraged to attend. So that's your role. You can reach out to them and let them know that it is available for free and encourage them to attend. I will also encourage the patient representatives to reach out to their colleagues and say, ha, ah, this year, instead of sending just one or two, we can be 10 attending. And I would say the same for industry. That's your opportunity. If you are in this webinar, you are the most convinced one, but try to convince your colleague in the different countries, in the different products, in the different functions of the company to attend or to attend the relevant segment. So now I have feeling I have uh, ended this uh, marketing promotion part, but I'm not doing it for the money it brings because anyhow we're losing significant money on this conference, but uh, because we really believe that it's a unique opportunity. And I would like to insist on a second message is that we have invested significant resources really by not to going to Stockholm and putting it online by investing in a robust professional platform. And we hope that the look and feel of this online conference will be uh, very attractive to you. Can we go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. Will be uh, attractive uh, to you. It is high quality and you will have four plenary sessions, 30 parallel sessions. You will have about 200 posters, if I'm correct, boot stands, meeting rooms, and also meeting points. There will be, the talks in the conference will be shorter, usually 10 minutes. There will be lots of question and answer space. There will be more panels, a lot of interactivity with votes, with chats, so plenty of opportunities to interact. There will be also a moment to meet the speakers at the end of the day. Like also to say that there is a subtitle in English for all presentations, so that's extremely useful, not only for people who are deaf, but also for um, anyone who is not completely at ease with English. And there will be translation in French and German for the plenary sessions. Certainly, we're losing the in-presence contact, obvious. Though we're getting several networking opportunities and like you, it's new to us. So we'll see, but we are making everything we can with direct contacts. You can directly contact any participant. You will have the name and contact details and affiliations. You can create your subgroups for your patient group, for your disease area, for your group of research, whatever, for your country. So you can create groups of discussion. You can chat during the sessions. That's fun. Usually we're obliged to be silent during a session. Here we can chat with the other participants while the speakers are speaking. And there will be a lot of networking segments. So next is what about COVID-19? How can we discuss and be focused on rare diseases while the environment is so much impacted or life, but also our work. And this is deeply, it has deepening consequences. So we have embedded COVID throughout the conference across the board, and there will be special networking room with a facilitator where to discuss COVID across the different stakeholders. You can also refer to a website section on where there is the a section with curated information and different links but also the open letter of impact of COVID 
And for you to know, we have ongoing a survey with the Rebarometer Voices, and we already received 2,000 responses since last weekend. So we hope to really bring to the surface a lot of the uh, information about the impact of COVID on daily life. Next, please, to the four main steps. So with, why, to, why to choose this topic for ECRD in 2020? And why to take the title of the journey of living with rare disease in 2030? For a simple reason is that there is a project called the Foresight Rare 2030. This project was initiated by European Parliament uh, based on, in particular, of the advocacy of Eurodis, but of others also. And it is funded by the European Commission and we brought together a consortium which has won the call and that brings together Eurodis with Isinova and we have Andrea with us. Uh, we academic partners from INSERM with Orphanet with the University uh, UCL London, Newcastle University, but also two European funds network for metabolic disease and bone diseases. And really the reason for all of that is that by failing to prepare, we're preparing to fail. And that's not me saying it, but Benjamin Franklin. So we can be inspired by these people. And in step one of our work through that project, we have established a knowledge base. A knowledge base based on all the scientific publications and the great literature. And after that, working with a large panel of 200 experts from all stakeholders, from all across Europe, but also some international, we have then analyzed and boiled down this knowledge base to identify the trends of the future. And we progressively went down to trends that Andrea will present in, in a moment. And we have identified the trends and drivers for change. And in addition to that, what could be the wild card? What, what could come in that could change everything? And COVID-19 typically is one of these wild cards. And that's why preparing for the future helps to adjust more rapidly, to be more agile, to be more resilient in your uh, strategies. So if we go to the six teams, the, that's exactly what we're gonna do during this conference, is that this is the moment of this, conf this conference starts the process between the work we have accomplished until now, which has been knowledge base, trends, and development of future scenarios basically the what if looking at 2040 2030 what if and then the different possible scenarios of future now what we are starting with you during this conference is the moment of the development of the policy options which will be the what how do we get to the best possible future by choosing among the different op possible future in these scenarios and mixing them obviously and for, to do that, we will go through these six teams and we will discuss the policy options by looking at 2030 in terms of the future of diagnostic, in terms of our values and rights and shipping paradigm for an inclusive society. And I'm sure Maya will come back to that. Share care and cure. How can we transform the care of rare disease by 2030? And how, how the new technologies also help us to transform that. Therapy development, access, patient-centric approach to therapeutic development, but also accessibility, availability, affordability, sustainability, and the digital health revolution, the hype and the reality of it. So we will cover all these themes. Now, if we go back to the wheels of the four steps, after this conference, we will use what you will have discussed in terms of policy options and take it to national conferences. There will be six national conferences taking place. Um, to discuss the policy option from a national perspective within EU integration. There will be also discussion with the panel of experts per subgroups, thematic groups on each policy options. There will be discussions with clinicians from the ERNs and stakeholders, 250 participants to that exercise. We will also have a survey of people with rare diseases, 10,000 of them in Europe. We will have a young citizen conference bringing young citizens, professionals, patient, persons living with a rare disease, relatives, 
to think about what they want in their generation. And all of that will come to a roadmap at the end, which will go to a European conference at the European Parliament in February next year to, in order to shape a new policy framework and Milan will cover that in a moment. So I stop with that and I now hand over to Andrea to present the methodology of this foresight study. I, I'm pleased to say that Andrea and his team are working on foresight in research, in alternative energies, on mobility and public transport, on defense strategy or, uh, or other topics. So what they bring is a robust methodology to think about the future of rare disease. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes. Um, uh, before I start, I think I, I would just uh, re-stress what, uh, what uh, Jan has already uh, repeatedly said, which is that one of the important uh, um, uh, ingredients for success and credibility of any foresight exercise is uh, to ensure that uh, um, those who participate uh, uh, gain ownership of these scenarios. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to devising policies associated to one or the other of the visions of the future, it is important that these visions are considered as plausible, as credible, and therefore the participatory dimension, which is uh, accompanying each and every step of this process, is absolutely fundamental. It's not just, you know, a, a lip service. It's uh, much more than that, and we are very grateful to all those who uh, are contributing to the various steps of this uh, participatory process. Um, next, please. Is someone more advancing the slides? Thank you. So, yeah, uh, just a, a brief premise on the spirit of foresight. Uh, the, one of the main challenges in foresight is to, to be able to deal with complexity. Uh, we are dealing with complex systems. There are many factors that influence, in particular, health, the health sector. And, and these factors are multiple. They are interrelated, uh, which uh, makes it uh, extremely uh, complex uh, to visualize and, and interpret uh, such a system. So the first thing that uh, a foresight exercise has to be uh, trying to do is to uh, represent these complex systems in a simple way, uh, in a, with a simplified framework, although, of course, trying to avoid oversimplification. This is the first part of this uh, kind of uh, horizontal timepiece that you see on the, on, the, on the screen. It's only when we have agreed on how to represent in a simplified way this complex system that we can elaborate more detailed visions that, that, that recapture the, the real complexity of the system itself. So the, 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 the goal, this is uh, something which I keep repeating, is not to predict the future, it's rather to show that there are different and at times highly contrasted possible futures. So uh, we must be prepared and hopefully um, be able to orient policies in the right direction. I think we've all heard and shared the now very uh, fashionable slogan, which is be the future you want, right? So this is what it's all about. Uh, next, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, very briefly, Jan has already mentioned uh, the first step, knowledge base. This is uh, about, you know, understanding what we are, basically. So where we are now and what are the uh, uh, emerging issues uh, uh, that uh, uh, should be uh, put in focus. And this, again, has been done with the contribution of a panel of experts and a number of other contributors and has led to a preparation of uh, a certain number of short summaries on each of the eight main uh, uh, dimensions that have been identified as characterizing the current state. You can download these summaries uh, here in the uh, address that it's in the, in the, in the slide that, that you're seeing now. Uh, next slide, please. Let me spend me, can I have the next slide? Yeah, um, and the next as well. Sorry, just to interrupt, uh, interrupt Andrea. We're just going to change the slides to a different source because they're quite fuzzy for some people. So, um, my colleague Davor is just going to change the slides um, and reshare so that everyone can see them properly because we've had several comments. Davor, mm. I, Anna, can you please stop sharing? Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, Jan mentioned that uh, the identification of trends and drivers is uh, one of the most demanding and interesting tasks of this process. Uh, this usually is, uh, uh, goes under the title of horizon scanning of trends, uh, which is the in a way a second step of our knowledge base. Um, the idea is to identify trends and, and drivers that will are likely to influence the future. This again uh, has been done through a multi-step participatory process and allowed us to go from a very long list, more than 100 of uh, proposed trends and drivers to a shorter one where 12 main factors uh, have been identified. You can see them on your screen. And uh, these 12 factors actually uh, uh, reflect the mix of uh, dimensions. There is a policy and governance dimension with the, uh, the need for uh, uh, stressing the importance of multi-stakeholders governance. Then there is a, an economic uh, paradigm dimension and the, how this applies to the health sector. So the relation to new healthcare delivery models and access to medical products. Then there's a, a, a social and demographic dimension uh, which reflects the nature of societal models and how these are able to actually accommodate the uh, uh, needs and requirements of, uh, of uh, patients, in particular for disease patients, uh, taking into account aging population, the current increase in inequality and the threats that is, this uh, uh, seems to be posing to uh, solidarity in general. But also on the positive side, the advocacy evolution and the patient empowerment and the uh, innovation in healthcare research. And finally, last but not least, of course, there's a technological dimension, which is uh, uh, again multifold with the, uh, the ICT revolution and all its implication in terms of the digitalization of healthcare services, such uh, the emergence of big data, artificial intelligence, and innovation in uh, medical knowledge in, in general. Uh, so, this is the uh, kind of compacted list of trends and drivers that we uh, have reached. Uh, and uh, from there, next slide, please. Uh, what we have uh, uh, then uh, tried to do all, uh, again with the uh, precious contribution from a, a number of experts and, and contributors is to uh, select, uh, to identify the, the, the criticality of these trends and drivers. So we, uh, these 12 are all important, but how critical they are now to, uh, uh, the, the, the usual methodology to identify criticality is, is to look on one hand, of course, at the importance, importance meaning if these things changes, how big is going to be the impact? So a, a, a cause to effect relationship in terms of, uh, the dynamics of, of each of these factors and the subsequent effect it may have on our target uh, uh, performances. But the second one, which is uh, also very important, is the uncertainty. Uncertainty means that we uh, don't know how to predict. It's not already on the cards. So clearly, it, it, it deserves additional attention because the uncertainty is high. But the bright side of this is that if something is uncertainty and is not on the cards, uh, one can uh, um, hope that there is more room for policy to actually intervene and steer uh, the dynamics of uh, given parameters in the right direction. So uh, this is why um, combining uh, the size of the impact, the importance, the relevance with the uncertainty is key in order to identify the, uh, what we call the critical uncertainties. Um, this uh, graph that you're seeing here is probably not too small for you to actually elaborate it, but I think it, it's interesting to see in the top uh, right uh, quadrant of, uh, of this scheme, um, the uh, main uh, uh, critical uncertainties that have uh, been identified and that can roughly be clustered around two main concerns. One is technological innovation and how it's going to be used, how developed and used. And the other one is uh, uh, everything that has to do with the uh, equity issues and the societal model that uh, actually drives the dynamics. So the, 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 we are still in the process of, you know, simplifying and, and, and trying not to oversimplify, but this is where we uh, get when we uh, reach the, 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 the center point of my, of my initial slide, the, 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 the horizontal timepiece. So these two dimensions are those on which we are now, uh, and I would ask the next slide please, to uh, build our scenarios by clustering uh, these two dimensions, the technological dimension on one hand and the equity and solidarity dimension on the other. Next please. 
Okay, so the first dimension, as I said, is, has to do with the type of innovation. I hope you can see on the bottom of the slide because uh, the screen, uh, uh, can you can you read even what is at the very bottom of the slide? I hope you do. Anyway, this uh, this uh, axis, this first axis, which has to do with the type of innovation, contrasts the two extremes. On one hand, on the top side, you have uh, uh, an innovation process uh, which is uh, assumed to be led by the genuine identification and uptake of uh, the patient's needs appraisal. So uh, this goes through a multi-stakeholders process uh, with a deep understanding of needs uh, as the starting point of the innovation process. Uh, on the bottom part of this uh, uh, axis at the other extreme, uh, on the other hand, we have an uh, uh, innovation process which is uh, uh, completely market it happens here is that technology innovation is developed per se and only once it's there uh, the, it seeks out uh, its market uh, so clearly these are two extremes and we'll see how this uh, pans out when combining them the second axis next slide please is about social attitude towards solidarity as i mentioned earlier so Again, the two extremes on the left-hand side, you have a, a society where uh, what prevails is individual responsibility, my mentality, my country, my organization, my research first. Um, at the other end, uh, you have a um, somehow more optimistic approach which uh, uh, underlines the need for a collective uh, accountability uh, to prevail with the policy priorities deriving from the the acknowledgement of the superior value of solidarity among citizens, countries, and communities. So these are the uh, four uh, extreme points of our uh, um, uh, compass, I would say. Uh, and by combining those, next slide, please, um, uh, we uh, build up these four scenarios. Uh, the titles are here, and in my next slide, I will try to give you some uh, uh, quick uh, brush strokes about the contents uh, in a very summary way, of course, because we don't really have the time to go into detail. In any case, uh, briefly on the top uh, right side, the combining patients-led innovation with collective accountability, we have a scenario which uh, underlines uh, the importance of investments for social justice. This is how we have dubbed it so far. Um, I would say on the other diagonal extreme, bottom left, uh, you have uh, the opposite scenario where uh, what prevails is individual responsibility combined with the market-led innovation process. And this uh, is uh, a scenario which uh, somehow uh, um, creates the illusion that technology alone will be able to save you. Uh, the other two scenarios, scenario two on the bottom right part is a scenario which we've termed uh, fast over fair and we'll say a, a few uh, words about it. So a, a trade-off, a compromising uh, approach to, uh, to uh, um, combining uh, uh, solidarity with the market-led uh, technology process. And at the top left, the fourth scenario, it's up to you to get what you need, uh, where um, there is a, a, a significant attention to appraising the needs of patients with, however, still a prevailing mentality of individual responsibility. This is our framework. This is how we have reached the identification of these four very contrasted visions. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have then tried, and this, like I said, is a very, very short and limited account, which doesn't do justice to the level of detail with which we are working on each of these storylines, but just to give you some uh, uh, quick strokes of brush on uh, the contents of these uh, uh, four uh, options. Uh, can I have the next, please? Uh, mm, so uh, investment uh, uh, for social justice, uh, there's a strong and balanced uh, role of governments. I think this is uh, what uh, strongly characterizes this uh, first scenario, which is reflected in the, in the, the health, health systems, uh, which are led by a holistic appraisal of patients' needs, but also in the governance of innovation, uh, including data collection and sharing and research priorities. Uh, as a result of a uh, uh, multi-stakeholders initiative. So this is the uh, first uh, scenario. Uh, the second scenario, fast over fair, can I have it please? Um, 
collective responsibility is also dominant in his scenario with, however, an innovation process, which is uh, in this case led by market forces. So technological progress is indeed fast and can lead to a variety of breakthroughs, but the, the, the weaker role of, of government means that uh, less targeted rules and incentives uh, exist and therefore uh, this scenario leads uh, to a priority setting uh, that reflects uh, um, primarily, you know, the, this, the search for quick solutions, for quick fixes. Um, and as a consequence, in that scenario, very rare and complex diseases are, are, are unfortunately likely to be left behind. Uh, the next scenario, please, uh, technology alone will save you. This is really an extreme scenario, which, however, uh, some of us may consider as uh, the most likely in a do-nothing perspective, uh, if you want to be gloomy. Um, is a scenario where actually healthcare uh, ends up by being um, almost so fully privatized, uh, the patients' organizations uh, almost disappearing as uh, taken over by, by, by technology uh, per se. Uh, of course, there are solutions available, but uh, only to those who can afford them, including uh, fast diagnosis, uh, cutting edge therapies, but, but, but broader data sharing is, is uh, not uh, there. It's hampered by the, the prevalence uh, of uh, commercial interests. And finally, the, the, the top left scenario, please, uh, up to you to get what you need. Here again, innovation is mainly available to the wealthy uh, and hampered by the, the, the lack of collaboration uh, across borders, across research communities. Uh, this is, however, partly compensated by healthcare systems based on a two-tier principle where at least the basic care is guaranteed by the public sector for all. Right, so this is, this is a very, very schematic and, and, and obviously rough way of uh, trying to characterize the, uh, these four scenarios uh, um, in, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let me go to the next and final step of this, uh, of this process, which is what Jan was mentioning at the beginning. We are here now and the next step uh, is uh, trying to devise and derive uh, uh, policies uh, and policy recommendations uh, uh, for the uh, future. Uh, this is what is usually uh, termed the backcasting exercise. The next slide, please. Right, backcasting as opposed to forecasting. Forecasting starts from the present and trying to predict the future. Backcasting starts from the identification of a vision, a future vision, and then uh, uh, courageously try to understand uh, how to get there, basically. So, uh, for instance, in the, in the blue uh, uh, dot that you see on the top right uh, hand, uh, uh, the possible uh, uh, rare diseases future, and we uh, obviously, uh, I think, uh, can all agree that out of the four scenarios that uh, I have briefly sketched, uh, there is one which seems to be uh, by far preferable to, to the others, it's, uh, it's the, the top right one. Uh, so for that one, clearly uh, what backcasting is expected to do is to try to figure out which policies are needed, uh, which policy packages should be devised uh, uh, in order to achieve uh, the vision that it uh, illustrates, including, of course, setting priorities, identifying uh, goals and the, 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 the metrics to monitor their achievement, uh, identifying knowledge gaps uh, and research uh, that is needed to address them. So that's the, uh, the first uh, um, objective of backcasting to understand policies that uh, might uh, help us in getting where we want to get. However, 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 uh, we all know that the future dynamics uh, uh, depend on a number of factors that are not uh, directly under the control of uh, the health community or for that matter, even of uh, inspired policymakers if we have them. So we need, uh, th this means we, we should also be prepared to react uh, and uh, adapt uh, to uh, futures that might uh, be closer to one or the other of the other plausible scenarios. Uh, this calls for uh, preparedness, uh, which materializes um, first and foremost in our capability to monitor and uh, being able to timely spot signals of change and, and uh, identifying promptly adaptation strategies and, and trade-offs that might uh, make uh, an undesirable future more acceptable. Uh, can you please go on? So how to get there and how to react, different, um, different approaches to uh, backcasting uh, which need to be combined, we need both. Uh, my last uh, slide and comment, please. 
is about uh, something that uh, Jan uh, timely hinted at the very beginning of this webinar, which is uh, uh, so-called wild cards. Okay, wild cards uh, are usually defined as events that have a, a low probability of occurrence, but if they occur, they may have a, a disrupting uh, uh, potential impact. Now, what often happens is the, the, the low probability element of this definition uh, often, more often than not, leads to actually sweeping them under the carpet, not considering them with sufficient attention. And I'm afraid this is, uh, to a large extent, what we're witnessing with the, with the COVID-19 um, with the COVID-19 scenario. Um, I don't want to elaborate on that, but I mean, uh, if you go back to a number of uh, uh, interventions that were made by eminent people like, uh, for instance, uh, Bill Gates or others uh, back in uh, 2015 or previously, uh, a call for attention to the probability of uh, such a disaster uh, was there but it wasn't taken up, not efficiently, not enough. So this is what the wild cards are all about. First of all, identify them, of course, but then include uh, some preparedness to deal with them in our scenarios. And this is uh, across all scenarios because most of these wild cards, uh, uh, well, of course, they depend, the probability depends on uh, a number of factors, but, but we are exposed uh, to the possibility of uh, many of these wild cards uh, in uh, many of uh, the uh, alternative futures that we Thank you, to describe. Uh, I will think I will stop here. I will not uh, comment. I mean, clearly, and last, uh, last click on the, on the right. Uh, what is Particularly interesting for us is the top part of this of this scheme, where we are looking at uh, uh, changes and and events uh, which uh, uh, arrive very rapidly, uh, making it more difficult to be prepared, uh, and also which are not the result of uh, you know uh, determined action on behalf uh, of uh, uh, this or that uh, community. So what the uh, Anglo-Saxons sometimes call acts of God as opposed to acts of man, right? So these are the most uh, critical uh, uh, potential uh, disruptive uh, uh, events. And I think uh, that uh, uh, what we have to do now in the last step of this foresight process is to make sure that we are able to incorporate at least some uh, um, serious thoughts about how to um, maintain our attention and prepare ourselves to adaptive strategies in, in this uh, situation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm sure that all participants found it very informative and useful, and I hope you uh, appreciate the methodology which is into it and that, you will, uh, that prepares you to play an active role during the conference. Some questions about the information are available online. Yes, everything will be, uh, is or will be on the website of the project where REF 2030 and Eva has sent you the link to that in, in the chat. So now I'm turning to Maria. Maria Montefusco, you are the president of the Swedish uh, Rare Disease uh, Alliance. You're also co-chair of this conference. Based on the scenario just presented by uh, Andrea, as a representative of people living with rare diseases, how do you see the impact? Or do you find yourself in one or two of these scenarios in terms of healthcare, quality of life, social service, um, access to treatment? Maria. Thank you very much, uh, Jan and uh, Andrea, for um, this interesting um, first part of the of the webinar. I think Davor, the slide uh, before this one is the one who's, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much and hello everyone. Um, I was hoping that I could use this, uh, this event for welcoming you to, to Sweden and to, to Stockholm. Uh, and uh, as Jan has already mentioned, even if we really, really want to, it's not possible. Uh, and um, that goes even for Sweden. Uh, so I'm not a researcher and I'm not representing that kind of uh, perspective here. Um, and thank you, Andrea, for simplifying uh, this method uh, for us. Uh, but I mean, it's still quite complicated. Uh, but as I've been uh, 
looking into this material and being a part of this pro uh, process, I can just tell you that this study holds so much interesting and useful content. And the last step of creating the strategic pathways to reach the scenarios that we want and avoid the ones that we don't want, I'm really, really looking forward to do that together with you during the conference later in May. So I have tried to imagine what it would be like to live with a rare disease in these four scenarios. Uh, sometimes I will use the situation in Sweden as an example and also my own experience. Uh, and I have actually chosen scenario one and two uh, and uh, while doing this uh, exercise uh, again I would like to stress that uh, this is just my interpretation interpretation and we can discuss these things um, at the ECRD. So in the scenario one, this investment for social justice uh, and uh, what has been called the supermax model uh, with infinite or smartly distributed resources enforced human rights and full inclusion of people with uh, disabilities and chronic diseases. And that includes, of course, people with rare diseases. Then my rare disease as I see it, would have less impact on my and my family's lives. This uh, scenario uh, would mean a situation for me closer to being equal with other people who do not live with a rare disease. Everyday life would be more about living and less just surviving. Uh, and I wouldn't be the rare one uh, in life's different situations as in my family. Sorry, just to interrupt. Sorry, Maria, to interrupt you. Would you mind just stopping and restarting your camera, please? And Davor, if you could okay. explain yeah, the slides, because sure. people want to see you and they can't. It seems to be fine now. We have okay. A, we had a can you see me now? Yes, but I just want to check. Can everyone else see Maria? Because several people yeah, have problems. I can see Maria. I can see Milan. Uh, other people can't. Can so it's... The camera. <laughs> Why no, can't other, you see me? The participants can't see, so we'll just try to fix that. But you carry on, Maria, because we can still hear you. Everyone can hear Maria, I believe. Okay, yeah. Yes, okay, good. you carry on. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, I was just thinking, is it a good thing or a bad thing that you cannot see me? I think, uh, I don't know. All right, um, then uh, in this uh, first scenario, uh, I would as I say, not be the rare one in life's different situations, such as in my family, uh, in school, at work, or in the healthcare system. I would be recognized as a person. In this holistic view, it makes it possible for me uh, to just reach out to society uh, like anyone else uh, and to any part of the system, healthcare or other uh, domains and be seen and listened to regardless of what kind of medical and social needs that I have. And the response from society would be well coordinated in a way that suits me and my family so we can focus on other things in life than staying just healthy and alive. And this system adapts to the individual even if it's a very strong focus on um, solidarity and, and collective um, measures and uh, not the other way around. So the system is the flexible one and the individual can be whoever she or he is. Another aspect that I thought of in this scenario was that the burden of explaining my condition and arguing for the treatments and support, uh, coordinating the up uh, around 40 different contacts, uh, the safeguarding, the planning is replaced by a smart and flexible system. And as the system is smarter, then resources can be distributed in a way that you will never be discriminated against or shamed out for being the expensive one. Uh, in scenario one, a person with a rare disease, uh, I am aware of that my situation is connected to the international network of people, actors and environments that want to help me to become and stay healthy and strong. Uh, that goes for my doctors who can easily reach out to the, to the uh, 
networks uh, of international collaborations for knowledge and treatments. My organizations that represent me gets empowered by and contribute to the international movement in solidarity. And I personally know uh, people all over Europe and the world with the same condition. And this is very good because when I hear about a new treatment and I can suggest it to my national system uh, and um, then access to it will be recognized as something possible to evaluate at least and bring forward. forward. Uh, a very in, uh, important aspect I think in this uh, scenario is that I believe that there is trust in it between individuals and the system and uh, uh, I can trust that I will get the treatment that I need. Uh, and uh, my family is not burdened by the failures of the system and I don't have to feel guilt about such things. Uh, if I should draw a line uh, from this uh, to the situation in Sweden, uh, in order to reach this scenario, knowing about what our members tell us uh, about their life situations, uh, we know uh, a lot of things from our members and also we know uh, a lot because uh, uh, of uh, what the families say that spend time at Ågrenska which you are quite uh, I'm sure aware of the uh, competence center in Sweden where we also collect information from families uh, living with rare diseases and adults. Um, we know that the government and the regional authorities need to cooperate more and put up measures in a national strategic plan uh, and yeah we actually don't have one uh, and that plan should of course play well along with the european and international contexts uh, we also need political will and strength uh, to create an infrastructure that takes up uh, from what actually really work well uh, in our country and uh, the existing ones and, and uh, then also fill in the gaps. And we have a lot of elements needed for this model already in place, but we need to pick up on the awareness, the early diagnosis, ability to coordinate measures and to make cross-border healthcare work for real. And I think this is uh, also the case in a number of other uh, countries in Europe. Uh, so I have just a few thoughts on this second scenario. Um, which is the fast over uh, fair and in that scenario i think uh, imagining living with a rare disease you and your family members uh, despite the disease really need to be heroes uh, excellent bureaucrats uh, professors in medicine and have uh, really uh, good skills of coordinating things. You also need an organization fighting for you through professional uh, lobbyism and uh, fundraising strategists and uh, the ability to raise an incredible amount of money is also important. Uh, this, unless you are one of the lucky ones with the right disease for which a treatment is either not a burden for the system or gains a big uh, profit to the industry that uh, develop it, uh, the treatments for it, uh, some will have it very easy and more will struggle. And these inequalities makes you frustrated and confused. Uh, in this scenario, you are not aware of uh, what is going on on the EU level, uh, unless it affects me and my disease specifically, um, or uh, in my family, uh, then probably I will uh, know exactly what's going on. And um, uh, I will fight my way through uh, the obstacles uh, for access. And even if Sweden is an economically strong country with a welfare system to be very proud of, uh, it's actually this picture that many of the rare disease uh, Sweden's members feel. The care is not equal and the system is definitely not perfectly organized. The difficulties of uh, rare diseases uh, to, to, to organize against them in the system could depend on the consequences of lack of awareness and also uh, because the system is very uh, strongly characterized by uh, silos. The, the system is um, fragmentized and sometimes it seems there is no, it seems that there is no knowledge or treatment, but there is, but it's just somewhere else. Uh, this goes for both treatment and research and knowledge. And it's often up to you to know where to find the competence and to make your way there. 
in my own case, I was born with dysmelia, which means I, uh, in my case, I don't have fingers on my left hand. Uh, for me, this is not very dramatic. Uh, and uh, uh, today I have very little uh, contact with healthcare due to my little hand. But there's also people with dysmelia who were born without legs or with just one leg and one arm and so on. So in Sweden, there are multi-professional teams for dysmelia and they exist, I dare to say, at all the uh, regional uh, healthcare regions. Uh, but the treatments and, and the offer that they make differ a lot. And it's still very up to um, where you happen to be born. Uh, that decides what kind of uh, treatments you are offered and support. And then on the other hand, if you know how that other offers are made in other regions, then you can just ask for it. Uh, and then um, I could talk a lot about this, but I uh, understand my time is up. Uh, so this is the case also in Sweden. And uh, uh, even if we have several expert teams, uh, they, they have different uh, offers to the people who, who need them. And I think two of these teams also receive uh, patients from uh, uh, other parts of Europe and the world. And uh, these people all are also offered different things. And uh, this is also one of the inequalities that, that we find uh, only through uh, international collaboration. Uh, so I will stop here. Uh, I think each of these scenarios may have some good or bad elements, but uh, at the end of the day, we need to make choices. And I hope that at the ECRD, we will get the opportunity to, uh, to uh, discuss on how to reach the, the, the future scenarios that we want to, uh, and also how to avoid the future scenarios where we don't want to end up. Thank you, Maya. I'm sure we will. That's the full purpose of this webinar and linking it with the, to prepare for the conference. Thank you very much for this answer. I'm turning now to, to, to Milan. Milan Macek is uh, not only the co-chair of this conference, he is also an advisor uh, in our advisory board of the project RARE 2030, uh, together with uh, other uh, excellent advisors that we have, like former director generals of the European Commission or high level representative of different uh, stakeholders from uh, industry or from academia. But also Milan was highly involved in shaping the European policy framework in 2008-2009 uh, toward the Commission Communication Council recommendation. So you have all that background, Milan. So when you, from the perspective of this project of RARE 2030 and of the European Conference, what, what do you see the outcomes of the discussions within the ECRD, within the conference, and what do you see next? So maybe I let you wrap up on these two uh, questions, how the audience is going to be involved uh, after the conference also. With the next slide, please, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. Thank you all. And really, my life is made quite uh, simple because I had an excellent introduction by previous speakers. So as Jan said, we are not starting out of the blue, right? We have already a very strong policy document. We have the EU Council recommendation on an action in the field of rare diseases, which was uh, drafted by the French and in fact um, ratified uh, by the Czech EU Council presidency. And this is the key document, uh, which in fact, led to the, uh, to the establishment of the European National Plans for Rare Diseases. Of course, there are some outliers and there are some countries which don't have plans or strategies, but uh, we can work with that. Usually those are the ones which already have a, like a independent pre-EU Council recommendation action on rare diseases, which is sort of customized for the national environment. So this is a major success, which in fact was followed upon in 2017 by the EU Council Presidency led by Malta and they had an excellent declaration on rare diseases and they in fact put three kind of let's say 
policy uh, policy proposals and they clearly said that there needs to be a structured cooperation in the field of healthcare which is quite obvious because it's also within the frame of the cross-border healthcare directive then structured cooperation on research and structured cooperation on access to uh, specific orphan medicine products and and drugs and uh, even medical devices which are applicable to rare disease patients and in terms of healthcare i think things are moving quite well because that's all within the eu council uh, cross border directive which is uh, sort of implemented although it has some shortcomings but we don't have time much to go into detail research is a great success because not only we have the international rare disease consortium but we also have now the uh, the ear we first had the ear which was com uh, which was followed upon by the european john action of rare diseases which already issued several calls so this is clearly a success and in terms of access there's still a lot of things to be done especially i refer to andrea what he was talking about all these scenarios so i mean rare disease patients are vulnerable and there's a special population it's not only the elderly or the immunocompromised populations in the time of the pandemic but also mar other marginalized populations which you need to take care of so then in 20 and 19, there was a very important document, which in fact kind of summarized from the economics and legal perspective, the, uh, the, uh, the current status of cross-border healthcare and the EU Court of Auditors, a very important body in fact said well there's a great uh, I would say ambition but we need better management and we need more structured steps so we can also relate to this um, uh, important document and work with the 24 um, uh, European reference networks on rare diseases which are really the key to implement all the actions on the ground within the European Union so I would just uh, finalize and I don't want to go much into detail you see it on the slide we had two successful conferences already and workshops in 2019 well we, we conducted interviews uh, which uh, which will be published and in a structured format we had a very successful workshop in brussels and now we are preparing for the online european conference for rare diseases um, in in two weeks time but i would I like to point that we really need your input and again i would like to quote andrea he nicely said be the future you want we really really need as broad as possible consultation. We really need all of you, your expertise, your, your opinions, your day-to-day -day experience with, with how you deal with your children, how you deal with cross-border care, how you, how you want to participate in research, clinical trials. So really we need all of you. Please speak up. We need the audience as uh, we need the feedback as broad as possible. But we also need, and this is the, the fourth line on this slide, we also need to counsel our future colleagues. So uh, we are really pleased there will be the Young Citizen Conference to be held again online in July, where we will be uh, enrolling at least 30 youngsters, young citizens from 18 member states to be as representatives as possible. Those will be future, uh, future healthcare professionals, um, uh, young patients, young researchers, PhD advocates, um, uh, future jurists, and so on. And we would also like to hear their future because we can be biased and we can have this historical baggage from all the actions we've done so let's look uh, let's look at the, it from a different perspective and let's think out of the box and let's see what the youngsters will come up with and then you, as you can see we will have these regional workshops uh, with uh, in fact coinciding with the EU presidencies of course in 2020 the Croatian and German might be shifted towards fall but we hope that uh, they can be regular workshops um, on site uh, for 2021 uh, portuguese slovenian and then importantly we very much hope that the french Czech and Swedish trio EU Council presidencies will deliver and we very much hope that we can take all the feedback from RARE 2030 and we can uh, we can especially compile feedback from the European Reference Networks, patient associations, Eurordis, you name it. I just 
I, it will be a long, long listing of who will in, uh, put a imp uh, the input. And we very much hope that then we can again backcast it. And again, I refer to Andrea, the methodology, together with European Reference Networks, because mainly we need to see what is realistic. We can have great ambitions, but we also need to see what is realistic on the ground. And there's no better forum than the ERNs and we hope to hold the workshops in, in September or slightly later depending on the status of the pandemic. And finally, what Jan was saying, we need to talk to the key policymakers and we hope to have a workshop for uh, selected EU parliamentarians and those are the ones who will be taking our, uh, let's say, recommendations and guidelines to another level and they will uh, draft uh, EU-wide policies together with us. So this is uh, what the status is, Jan. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Milan. Thank you for wrapping up so well and showing what, what's coming next. And I'm sure that all participants in this webinar understand that the conference is going to be a moment to a key moment, this pivotal moment from looking at the future scenarios to policy option development, but there will be other opportunities to participate. Uh, some questions have been raised about when, when the national workshops will take place, etc. All that will be further communicated probably at the time of the conference, but also on the website of RARE 2030. So if we can move to the last slide, Anna, is um, in fact, because it's already an hour and, and one minute that we are in, in the webinar, we were not exactly sure how, how it will, how it will uh, flow. We, I'd like to thank you very much for all the questions that you put into the chat, but also into the question and answer uh, box. The, the team has made their best efforts to try to answer online, both Eva uh, Biriman, our communication manager, but also uh, Anna who is in charge of the project where 2030 and um, Anna has given uh, her private her mail uh, her email address so that uh, to some participants so that the conversation can continue for specific questions so we've tried to answer these questions as we could along the line the this presentation is made available and you have the link that has been sent to you it can maybe be resent again now in the long trade long trade of, of, of chats the, you can join the ECRD website to see the developments of the, of the program and the speakers. The question was raised, can I attend from one team to another? Yes, in fact, you, you pick and choose whatever you want among the teams. And the good thing is that all the presentations will be available in the following days and weeks for one year. So you can, if you are a big fan, you can even attend the 30 sessions if you want parallel session. So that's also very unique of the fact of being uh, uh, online. I'd like to thank very warmly uh, Andrea for joining and for his uh, insightful presentation. I'd like to thank very much Maria and uh, Milan uh, for their uh, comments today and inviting us to join uh, ECRD. I'd like to thank Anna and also Tina and Oliver for signing online. That's impressive. Uh, you impress me when you're on TV, but it's impressive online too, really. So if you're not registered, don't forget to register. Use these two website address. We wish you a fantastic day and we're looking forward to see you online, obviously, for the ECRD 2020. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you, dear speakers and team. Thank you.